All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So we have plenty of time for uh, our talk and discussion. So uh, for those of you who weren't outside, uh, welcome again to our Graduate Research Day. This is one of our signature events uh, each year where we celebrate the achievements of our graduate students. This year, as I mentioned, we're doing a collaboration with Mechanical and Materials Engineering. Uh, but you'll see that you know, we have certain tracks during the day that, um, that biomedical engineering is by ourselves. We can focus on biomedical applications and then we'll kind of integrate together during lunch and, and for the, the closing ceremony as well. So it should be a lot of fun today. Um, so I really welcome you to stick around all day, see work by our students and, uh, and, and our um, visiting uh, faculty as well. So we'll start this morning with our keynote lecture, uh, which is given by Dr. Delia Dubuc, uh, who comes to us from University of Miami, uh, from Boston Palmer right, Eye Institute where she serves as a research associate professor in ophthalmology. Uh, she earned her PhD in applied physics at the University of Michigan, uh, and, um, and then has joined the, the University of Miami, and is a renowned leading biophysicist in the field. Uh, her research group has garnered significant support from prestigious institutions, including uh, the NIH, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, the NIA, uh, and other foundational support. Uh, and her research focuses on advancing medical applications of ultra-fast technology and optical imaging, um, particularly enhanced ocular uh, uh, healthcare capabilities. Uh, so she's really a pioneer in this field and has done groundbreaking research and is deeply committed to leveraging artificial intelligence applications for disease diagnosis uh, and does multidisciplinary research. Uh, so harnessing AI machine learning uh, in digital health, brain computer interface, she's investigating interest connections between the eye and the brain. Uh, so we are delighted to have her here today as our keynote lecture. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction and for inviting me uh, today to have the opportunity to share with you uh, my research at the uh, Pasco Palmer Institute. I'm really uh, excited to, uh, to explore the fascinating application of biophotonics inocular and brain disease uh, diagnostics. So let us see what lies ahead in this captivating uh, field. These are my disclosures. Um, this is the outline uh, of our presentation, just to give you an idea of what is going to happen uh, in, the, in the next hour. First, I will briefly introduce the importance of biophotonics in medicine diagnostics and then I will show you some of the optical imaging technologies embracing the eye and the brain connections along with the discovery of novel uh, biomarkers. Then I will uncover how these technologies can be translated into the clinic to impact healthcare. And I will also dedicate some time to talk about the current biophotonics industry trends regarding job and market trends. So first of all, um, let me lay the foundation for our exploration today regarding the role of biophotonics in ocular and brain uh, diagnostics. Here we have that biophotonics combines photonics and biology, and it's a multidisciplinary research field that embraces all life-based technologies applied to life sciences and medicine. It refers to using photonics or optical means to examine, control, and track biological processes at various levels of biology, it could be the cellular level, the tissue level, the molecular, and even the organism level. To show you how photonics have been used in the ophthalmic field, we will first uh, revise some of the optical imaging technologies currently used in, uh, ocular, uh, in the ocular field. So here, for example, you can see that um, the retina is a layer uh, tissue that, that is lining the interior of the eye and enables the uh, conversion of incoming light into a uh, neural signal that is suitable for further processing in the visual cortex of the brain. And it is thus, as you can tell, an extension of the brain, right? Now, retinal imaging has undergone a revolution in the past 50 years to allow us for a uh, better understanding of the eye in health and disease. Significant improvements have occurred because of hardware, such as lasers and optics and software and image analysis. You can see here that I have tried to pretty much synchronize the uh, different uh, uh, different uh, uh, imaging modalities that I have 
have used or explored in my research. So to give you an idea uh, how in the electromagnetic spectrum these modalities are operating. Okay? Now, uh, optical imaging modalities have enabled improved visualization of retinal uh, pathophysiology and have substantial impact in basic and translational medical research. And this improvement in technology have translated into early disease detection in the more accurate diagnosis, for example, and also in, improve, uh, in improving the management of numerous retinal diseases, particularly optical coherence tomography, which is shown here. You can see this is actually volumetric or a 3D view of the retina. Notice the uh, Fourier depression. And also you can see the different cellular layers of the retina. This sketch is shown here, or you can see here how the cellular layers compares with histology. Now this is a technology that is based on the principle of reflectometry and uses low coherence interferometry to produce two dimensional and three dimensional images of optical scattering. Over the year has been uh, developing immensely at the point that right now we can even uh, have the capability to, uh, to show angiograms of the uh, retinal uh, vasculature. And it's actually the most widely used of thermic decision making technology in the market. A British history about this technology, we have that um, it was first developed by Fujimoto's group at the MIT uh, in 1991. Since, since, since its introduction, <coughs> In the early 90s, this technology actually continued to advance to provide quicker acquisition times and higher resolution, as you can see in the uh, graph showing the trend. This is, this is a technology that is continuously evolving as lasers are getting better and better, and of course, software and computers are getting better. For example, uh, there is a variety of modalities taking advantage of this optical imaging technique, like for example, polarization sensitive OCT, adaptive optics OCT, visible light OCT, white field, field, dynamic field, uh, high resolution, intraoperative OCT, we, we may have a handheld OCT already, and there is also a home OCT that is being used at home for managing insulated macular degeneration, and lately we have the development of quantum OCT. This is actually happening right now uh, it's, it's a relatively new concept that combines optical coherence tomography with quantum optic uh, principles to potentially enhance the imaging uh, resolution. It's, it's actually a research that is still in early stage, and practical implementations are actually uh, limited. Okay? However, we expect that uh, this technology, once ready, could potentially enable us to image at the molecular or even submolecular level, so passing the limitation of the current uh, technologies. Now, we can actually capture uh, or measure uh, a lot of uh, metrics with this technology. Uh, for example, we can, we, can, we can assess thickness and volume of the retina tissue. We can also measure uh, the specific optical properties like relative reflectivity or, or the attenuation coefficients. Uh, polarization properties, for example, are retardance and fibrofringes. We can have an idea about the uh, vasculature, vasculature network uh, conditions, like for example, the tortuosity of the vessels on the back of the eye. And we can also have information about uh, the blood flow, like for example, the perfusion level, both in healthy and in disease uh, conditions. Now, this is how this technology compares with other neuroimaging uh, techniques. I mentioned that, I would like to mention that current neuroimaging methods like uh, functional MRI or MRI and PET scans, they provide an excellent images of the brain, but those images often lack the spatial resolution and the imaging speed that is actually required to image at the cellular and neuronal uh, level in real time. So you can see that OCT is able to uh, spatially resolve in the order of micrometers and temporarily in the order of milliseconds, milliseconds as the other technologies that are actually outlined here. This is the other imaging modality that I would like to show you that I have been using in my research. This is a scan and laser of Talmus hole. And this is an instrument that uses a collimated beam of laser light. 
to image the retina and the optic nerve head. This is actually the optic nerve head and this is the macular section here as you can see. So although this particular uh, technology for clinical practice was introduced as early as in the 90s, it was not routinely utilized due to this advantage like inferior resolution, bulky equipment, and the high cost. These disadvantages were actually overcome by uh, uh, the confocal arrangements where the scattered light raised on the ocular structures are detected at a focal point that is conjugate to the focus of the point illuminated, right? Newer applications of SLO, like for example, uh, multicolor and white field imaging have revolutionized the diagnosis and management of retinal diseases. And for example, when combined with adaptive optics that is a specific uh, te a technique that is initially using uh, for astron uh, imaging in astronomy, we can see that it helps elimination of optical aberration. So it is able to uh, give us a visualization of individual color receptors uh, in vivo. This slide shows the advantage of the SLO, the confocal SLO technique compared to the standard uh, from the scammer, as you can see here, uh, the specific confocal SLO uh, technique allows acquiring images at different penetration le uh, lengths that you see that we have here with the green and the, uh, the pure green and the infrared bandwidth that we can actually have uh, more information about the choroidal, le uh, choroidal layers with the infrared uh, wavelength. Now, the other imaging modality that has been using in my research is a laser spectral uh, contrast imaging. The, the first application of utilizing the spectral pattern reduction to mapping a retinal blood flow was reported in 1982. And at that time, it was called, it was a technology uh, that was now called a single exposure spectral photography. Now, it was successfully improved in the 90s after the development of digital techniques such as the CCD, camera, decimal sensors, and computers. The improved technology is called, and this thing here, laser spectral contrast imaging. And this, this particular modality measures the ocular blood flow by examining the pattern of the spectral contrast produced by the movement of the auditor size in the ocular blood vessels. Now this here, for example, that the contrast is lower at the vessel area compared with the speckle at the uh, surroundings. And these are images, typical images that we can obtain with this modality. The advantage is that allows to actually assess the retinal function in a, in a dynamic manner. And we can also synchronize it with the uh, heartbeat uh, uh, measurements. So um, the advantage also of using this technology is that, is that uh, it allows insights for early and more specific diagnosis of ocular vascular disorder and facilitate also the exploration of eye-based biomarkers that can be also applicable to neurological health, health assessment and research. Now, this is another imaging modality taking advantage of biophotonics that we have uh, investigated. Uh, late, we are using later in our uh, studies uh, this is a functional near infrared spectroscopy or a NIRS, and this is a promising tool for understanding the human brain's uh, complex working due to its ability to measure changes in oxygenating and deoxygenating hemoglobin levels. So it gives us an insight into the neural activity and the functional connectivity in the brain. So if this is a technology that has been out there for more than 40 years and has undergone significant advancements. Uh, the first device uh, to detect um, hemoglobin with, a, with only a low spatial resolution single channel uh, continuous wave system was introduced in 1977. And in 1984, a second system was developed to measure changes in oxygenating and deoxygenating hemoglobin. In 1994, then a 10 channels continuous wave system was developed. And by the early 2010, a wearable battery operating single channel system was created. So the, today we have three main types of the near technologies, including the time domain, the frequency domain, and the uh, continuous wave uh, technologies. You can see here um, one of the, the, the caps that are used for um, 
the technique. Let me show you um, the, the technology that I'm, I'm using. This is a external flow uh, technology from external company. It's a company in, a, in LA. Um, and this is a device that we are using to investigate the aeropathic eye pain. Uh, this image here, for example, shows the kernel flow device. This is a kind of a wearable device. It's a helmet. Um, it's, it's small. It has a modular full mask uh, designed for real-time monitoring of tissue oxygenation in the brain. And the device, like functional MRI, offers a glimpse into the brain activity, but at a more portable and cost-effective scale. It operates with laser wavelength lens at the order of 690 and 150 nanometers. And 200 hertz of the is a sampling uh, frequency. Additionally, the device uh, includes uh, six active dry electrodes that are integrated into the helmet. Uh, they are shown here. Those are the electrodes uh, heaters. And also, uh, they are strategically placed in the 10 10 grid of the skull. Uh, of the skull. And this, this is also has a high channel density, allowing monitoring of more than 500 plus channels uh, from the device. It weighs about 2.2 kilograms. Now let me show you now that I introduce some of the um, optical imaging modalities that are taking advantage of biophotonics. How I have been using uh, these modalities uh, for different type of uh, ocular conditions or even brain disorders, uh, mainly for uh, the investigation of uh, biomarkers for early detection of specific diseases. So first of all, I would like to uh, introduce you uh, the eye-brain connector, right? Because I'm going to be using this term a lot. So um, this term may sound complex, but it is a fundamental uh, uh, idea that underpins our understanding how our vision and brain are intimate. Intertwined, right? So they are interconnected, and this connection are just roads. They are information highways transmitting data from the eye to the brain and back again, right? Now, one of the things that is important to uh, consider is that uh, the connector is composed of uh, countless and neural pathways, and it allows to see, for example, interpret and make sense of the world around us. This is the biological foundation of our vision and perception. Consider, for example, the uh, condition of deprivation around myopia. In this context, for example, the eye brain connectome helps us understand why individuals with this condition may experience reduced visual acuity in one eye, even when the eye, the eye itself appears healthy. Right? So if you have, for example, an optometrist and an ophthalmology that is trying to screen the eye of a patient with, the, with, with, with this type of disease, there is no way that can probably figure it out better because they need to look back in the brain, figure out why the, the patient has this problem. Measure visual acuity, visual fit may not be able to give any indication that something may be wrong in the uh, occipital area. So let us explore why this concept is so crucial and how it is transforming the landscape of health. This is a very complex uh, slide, okay? But I try my best to comfortably see so I can show you uh, the, key, the key points here, right? So we have ocular manifestation of neurodegenerative disorder. For example, we can have a stroke, we can have Alzheimer's, we can have Parkinson's, we can have uh, multiple sclerosis, all right? And all these diseases, at some point when they start developing, it are showing manifestations in the eye that we can track and assess over the time, all right? Now, I want to show you that um, the idea of using the eye as, uh, the eye as a biomarker for diseases in the brain comes from the idea that the eyes are the windows of, our, of the cell, okay? So we can actually explore the eye in many ways and see what may be happening in the brain, in your heart, in the kidney, you name it. It's actually a very good uh, media uh, to explore different conditions that may be not functionally uh, working well in our uh, in our body. Now, I want you to notice something. I'm going to focus on the Alzheimer's disease and the Parkinson's disease because these are the images that I'm showing on the sides for them. 
So to give you an idea uh, about the kind of differential diagnosis that we can obtain when analyzing these particular diseases with the eye, all right? Now, for example, you can see uh, for the Alzheimer's disease condition, you notice that um, there is retinal ganglion cell loss. This is one of the cellular layers. And you know, we have uh, amyloid beta uh, and beta accumulated in the brain. These, these are just uh, pathological features that can be observed with positive emission tomorrow. However, animal models of Alzheimer's uh, um, in, uh, have showing also that this amyloid beta is accumulated in the brain. Now, if you, if you check, check this, this uh, back of the eye here, you notice that and just um, try to show you that in Alzheimer's, around the optic nerve. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. I saw the time that you were actually. So looking at my point, sorry about that. So here, for example, you can see that um, in this area, this is for the Alzheimer's. Okay, this is the retina and optic nerve in, in Alzheimer's. And you can see that the superior, the nasal, and the inferior regions are the ones that are, um, are the ones that are, are, are the, one, uh, the more affected areas, all right? And now you see that around the macula, this is the less affected area, okay? And this is where we have the uh, barbocellular ganglion cells around the macula and the microcellular <coughs> cells around the optic nerve. Now, if you take a look at the Parkinson disease, it has the opposite uh, trend, right? For example, in, in Parkinson, um, we also have retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. This is also in place in Parkinson, but it's more pre in Alzheimer's, but it's more predominant for the ganglion cell complex. And then you see that, that we had the reverse. We had that the uh, less affected areas are, are around the optic nerve, and the more affected areas are around the muscle, all right? So this is a good example showing that uh, we can work out a way to find uh, differential diagnosis for these two diseases using the eye, right? Um, there are certain pathological processes that may be uh, preferentially affected in Alzheimer's disease. For example, as I showed, there is a predominant uh, loss of M cells in the retina, all right? And that can, what, what can actually that create for the, uh, for the individual? Well, there is, they have difficulty in, for example, um, determine emotion or in depth perception, and they have also issues with uh, eye movements, uh, like for example, saccadic eye movements, and they have also issues with uh, color vision, all right? So many studies have been exploring uh, the eye as a, as a biomarker in, in a specific or different neurodegenerative diseases, and it has been found that a decline in larger diameter axons in the optic nerve, and this is for Alzheimer's, suggests that the M cells, rather than the B cell pathway, is affected in Alzheimer's. And that the M cell vulnerability to Alzheimer's disease pathology might be related to different vulnerabilities of retinal ganglion cells to amyloid deposition. Now let me show you my next slide. What we have done specifically with the idea of using the eye as a biomarker of, of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Most of the uh, research or the studies that have been uh, currently published are using a unimodal approach. So they are only using, for example, imaging modalities. So they are reporting how the structure may be changing. It could be a vascular change, it could be uh, changes in the thickness of the different cellular layers, for example. In our case, we embrace uh, a multimodal approach in which we combine a structure and function. A structure that we are just uh, finding from uh, imaging, okay, and function from electroretinography. Electroretinography is pretty much like an electroencephalogram is doing the brain. So we are trying to measure the electrical activity of the different uh, retinal uh, neuronal cells um, and see how uh, the eye may be uh, working to be dysfunctional or, or just simply healthy, okay? So we combine these two uh, modalities. Imaging, in particular, I use uh, a confocal uh, scanning laser or thermoscopy uh, device, and I use a handheld device, which is a full-field uh, 
electro uh, retinography device, which may actually uh, uh, simply the an overall view of the uh, electrical activity. So it's not localized, all right? So it's a massive global response we're obtaining with this device, but it gives me an indication of what may be happening at the level of the photoreceptors and the uh, ganglion cell also with the specific protocols that we that we use. So with this particular approach, what we did was think investigate the correlation between the retinal vascular complexity and functional changes in patients with cognitive impairment. And the main idea was try to see if there was any retinal alteration in these elderly individuals that may add value to the early detection of Alzheimer's. And even to cognitive decline, independently of causation, it can be Alzheimer's, it can be vascular dementia, it can be body dementia, you know, so the, the dementia spectrum is, 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 is huge. So, and the idea was also that can we find biomarkers that can be low cost? Biomarkers that, for example, we can explore at the point of care. You know that MRIs are expensive. Not every patient has access to MRIs because some health insurance are not too happy to pay for that, all right? And, and this is really expensive on top of that. Now, this is actually, um, these are actually images from two patients, and I want to show you the type of features, pathological features that we um, obtain from them or, or, or were able to detect from um, their, their uh, retina. As you can see, for example, here, this is a female patient, of 78 years old with mild cognitive impairment, and we notice extramacular drusen, which are indicated by the red arrows, but these are just uh, extramacular drusen, Drusen is a type of pathological uh, feature that is pretty common in age-related macular degeneration, all right? Now, these are not exactly Drusen features, but they look like the Drusen that we can see on, on patients with AMD, all right? Uh, we verified with the uh, ophthalmologist working with us that any of these individuals has uh, macular degeneration, all right? But we observe this type of pathology on the back of the eye. We also observe some pigment dispersion, like this granular or textural tissue here uh, on the structure. And the same was actually in place for the second patient. We have more patients, I'm just showing two of them, okay? So we, we show, uh, again, this extramacular bruise and light regions, and also pigment uh, dispersion. This is how the back of the eye in a healthy individual looks like, okay? So you can see how uh, the texture can see the tension on, on that tissue, how it compares with the other two individuals' uh, images that I'm showing you here. I want to show you this uh, study. This is a study from um, a different group. Actually, this was the, the first group that came with the idea that we can use the eye to detect biomarkers for Alzheimer's. Um, they started using animal models first and verify later in humans that yes, that we have amyloid beta that accumulated in the back of the eye. So this is uh, this is one of the most uh, well known papers in, in the field, okay? I just wanted to show you that this group is also uh, reporting this type of white spots or blue and light regions, as I like to call it better, uh, that actually uh, resemble the type of features that we were able to observe with also our focal SLO device. The only difference is that in this group, uh, they have to give the patient a curcumin pill. So the curcumin bind, binds to the amyloid, and this is how they can visualize these uh, amyloid beta spots on the back of the eye. I just wanted to show you, so you can see that uh, there is kind of uh, similar similar trends that we have also obtained without the need of using a curcumin in these patients. And the patient has to be taken the curcumin pill like three days before and come back to the clinic for the screening so they can see the amyloid beta spots. Now, in our particular study, what we, what we did is that first when we forward to apply the images, then we segment those vessels, as you can see on that on that screen. These are the skeletons, okay? So notice that this is for a healthy, this is for a patient with mild cognitive impairment, and this is for a patient that has more than cognitive impairment, like kind of moderate cognitive impairment, so it's not, it's not really anymore at the early stage like like the common patients that we want to screen. Okay, then we move forward with uh, a multifractal analysis. Um, you see, we section the back of the eye uh, in nine sectors, and we, we just calculate uh, the fractal dimension in these different sectors. 
fractal fractals are, are you familiar with fractals before I continue? The fractals are, are very well used in nature. You know, if you, if you go outside, you can see a tree without any leaf as a, a fractality part, right? And it's pretty well used for just describing or detecting uh, features that may not be uh, working well, maybe just dysfunctional, right? Depending on the value of the fractal dimension. So this is what we use. We use multifractal and multifractal approach first to characterize the structural information on the back of the eye, and then uh, we also use keep in mind we also use uh, electrohotinography. We simply just uh, run a protocol uh, in which we were able to assess the ganglion cell complex uh, function, right? And this is this is just a type of measurement that allows to assess the amplitude of the response and the implicit time, which is from the time that we set the stimulus at the time that that particular uh, neuronal cells may be responding to that stimulus, okay? So we have different parameters that we have put together in the uh, multimodal approach. The multifractal uh, dimension components, so there are some metrics there, and the amplitude and the implicit time of the response as we stimulate the eye with the specific protocol that we use. So as you can see here, about 69 participants uh, show at the clinic. I want to mention that the initial idea of our approach was to actually use this as a screening tool at point of care. So it's not like a patient going to a neurologist or a psychiatric doctor, like, you know, and losing my memory, I want to have a check, a check, a check up, you know? So the idea was like, okay, let's see what happened. Let's screen all the patients coming to this particular, uh, it was a clinic in the community, and we were acquiring data from them, so you can see, we actually uh, recruited 69 of them, and the interesting part is that they, they have a lot of comorbidities, all right? So 32 had a cognitive impairment, and after applying all exclusion criteria, a total of 20 subjects with cognitive impairment and 19 healthy controls were included in the final analysis. You can see that I'm reporting, for example, um, if they have hypertension, if they have diabetes, if they have dyslipidemia, were smoking, for example. So all these are comorbidities that are superposed to the actual problem with memory, right? And just to give you um, briefly, what is the problem with this is that, for example, if the patient is diabetic or hypertensive, this is also going to show in the retina, okay? So it's going to be a, a kind of a bias for the kind of uh, trend that you're trying to find. Now, what I did in this case is, okay, I know those comorbidities are superposed, I'm going to keep it as it is. I don't think that it would be too useful to collect patients with only my cognitive impairment and no comorbidities because this is so common. Most of them, when they are over 65 years old, they have tons of comorbidities. And being in Miami, which is a Hispanic community predominant, you know what is happening with our population, okay? Now, we found, for example, uh, lower fractal dimension values, okay? So remember, this is the vessel pattern in the back of the eye that is less complex, all right? We found, so it's more dysfunctional, the structure. We found higher lacunarity values. So the vessel pattern in the back of the eye is more <coughs> heterogeneous. The lacunarity is, is a metric that allows to, to analyze the gappiness or the gaps in the structure, okay? Like in my age, you have a patient with um, diabetic retinopathy at the advanced level is going to have ischemic areas in the in the back of the eye. So you can see that the gappiness is high because it's really having areas that are not perfused anymore, right? Now, and we also find functional loss in color vision. This was done with uh, the standard uh, techniques that they use at the clinic for a comprehensive eye examination, either visual function or, 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 or the, the color vision tests that are uh, commonly used at the eye clinic. And then we also find shorter amplitude, sorry. Shorter amplitude and delayed response to the flicker stimulus in the electroretinogram. So the general trend in this small population is was that the fractal measures were significantly associated with condition. All these patients actually received uh, a, a cognitive test, which was uh, a, a MOCA. And uh, the electroretinogram metrics were also correlated. So we have kind of uh, markers that could be explored moving forward with this uh, multimodal approach. Now, 
as I, as I show you on um, two slides before this one,
Um, here I'm using the OCD and geography. I mentioned from the very beginning that the OCD technology it was, uh, it was the capability of, uh, uh, of 10 angiograms from the structure. So notice that these were um, twins. One of the sisters um, was actually cognitively healthy. The other one had Alzheimer's. And you can see the differences in the structure. For example, this is the foveal vascular sun. So you can see that in the patient with Alzheimer's disease, we have, we have, we have an enlarged foveal vascular sun. Regarding perfusion, perfusion in the, in the structure, you can notice the perfusion or the vessel density also in the healthy cognitively sister and how the structure is in the uh, system with that side. So you can see that uh, ocular images, dependently of the modality, can give us indications of things that may be dysfunctional in the individual and probably correlate with the uh, condition in the uh, patient. So this is another type of uh, technology that has been explored, but keep in mind it's only unimodal, so the only thing that I, they, they are assessing here is the structure. And the uh, information about blood flow perfusion is actually subjective, all right? Because they are deriving this particular information from the structure, from the uh, thickness information, all right? You have different scans, and they actually create an algorithm. It is actually a, a software development. It's not actually uh, anything optically uh, engineered, but they just reconstruct the angiogram from the scans that they obtain very very slight. Okay, so it's, it's a subjective. It's not actually a direct measure of blood flow. Now this is another another uh, comparison uh, between a part, a, an individual with Parkinson and uh, and uh, a healthy individual using the same technology. Again, you can see that uh, there is kind of a retinal circulation deficit in the Parkinson disease patients compared to the healthy individual, all right? So kind of giving you an idea how we can use the eye to actually find or identify biomarkers that may help us objectively uh, predict specific neurodegenerative conditions using actually a low-cost approach, okay? And that is also not invasive. These are some preliminary results um, that we obtained uh, with the company at the time we were uh, researching um, uh, with this device. As they, come, they have continued actually uh, using the device for different conditions like uh, individuals with type 2 diabetes or with mild cognitive impairment or even with uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy. Just wanted to show you these very early results in which you can <coughs> see that, for example, they try to correlate uh, the groups, and they found that uh, there was not actually a good um, a good differentiation using this technology when comparing individuals with type two diabetes and the health, okay, or even with the with the uh, with the MPDI. However, when the analysis was run and we compared uh, those patients with mild cognitive impairment versus the healthy and the ones with type two diabetes with and without retinopathy, we found actually a good way to differentiate, at least by using the blood flow information from the arteries and the vein independently. So, let me show you now another, uh, another example in which you can see how we can obtain a more accurate diagnosis by using uh, optical coherence tomography. For example, uh, this is particularly uh, for, a, for an individual with elevated intracranial pressure. Okay, and this is a very challenging uh, diagnosis for uh, neurologists and ophthalmologists. And any delay in diagnosis can result actually in an irreversible uh, damage to the optic nerve, okay? Now, in this particular study, uh, this group was able to identify uh, four patterns that they have actually standardized and used for all these cases that may run into a clinic with this particular issue. And basically, as you can see, the images, which they are a little uh, small to, to, to analyze, but I would like that you focus probably in the one that is easier to, uh, to see. Like, for example, you can see these temporal wings here. This is the optic nerve, okay? So you can see the temporal, and I'm showing here thickness information, thickness information of the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer, which is the first layer that you see in the structure. So you see here that 
there are temporal wings with nasal depression, okay? So this temporal increase in that nerve fiber layer thickness is seen with that depression of the nasal area. And the group came with the hypothesis that the nasal actually gets damaged early in this particular uh, condition because areas of the nerve are very pressure sensitive. So the temporal wings are prone to uh, CSF leaking into the temporal disc. So by using these four patterns that they, they just find out in all patients with this particular issue with elevated intracranial pressure, they are able to actually obtain a more accurate diagnosis. And specifically, they say, oh, a patient with headaches or with migraines requiring multiple physician visits for, for these conditions actually should be considered for an OCD scan of the optic nerve and macula. And then if, we found, if they found uh, these four, uh, these, these four uh, conditions that they just explored in, 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 the, in the study, then they should have an MRI. And if normal, then they should actually undergo a lumbar function as well, okay? So just keep in mind that this particular technology in the eye can be actually, um, be low cost, it can save money to the system because instead of sending directly the patient to get an MRI that costs so much, you can actually have the very first information on what may be wrong, so you can route the patient for and, and you can save money to the healthcare system in that way. Now, this is another case for uh, retinopathy of prematurity. This is for babies and newborns. Uh, you can see here, this is the uh, handheld OCT device that is being used at the nucleus, you know? And the good thing is that OCT and geography, like showing here, can visualize extra retinal neurovascularization. I continue forgetting that I need to point it out not there. Uh, Sorry about that. So you can see now that uh, this um, this image, for example, is the two-dimensional view of the of the of the back of the eye for this baby, you know, and it clearly shows the presence of the residual flow. The red color actually is the flow, okay? So you can see that there is the presence of residual flow above the internal irritable membrane near the border of the perfuse and non-perfuse uh, retina, right? So. The quanti using this technology, quantifying uh, the area of ne neurovascularization might provide an objective biomarker of disease severity that can tra be tracked over time. And at this point, it's really good to have this technology because there are a lot of uh, legal issues with these babies. It's like they may be in the NICU, and if this is not reported to the parents and the baby gets blind four years later, they come back. Like you never told me about this, okay? So this is so this is why it's so important to have this type of technology at this point of time, so we can actually prevent blindness in these babies. Um, now there are plenty, plenty of uh, retinal markers for disease. This is just a very, very uh, small view of what's going on in the field with this technology, okay? But you can see by reading. All the papers that I'm showing there that this is a technology that has been used to analyze bipolar disorder, depressive disorder, schizophrenia, uh, Huntington disease, all kind of different diseases affecting the brain and mental health can be actually uh, explored with this uh, technology. And simply because the eye is an extension of the brain, right? So just keep, keep that in mind. All right, now, um, I would like to uh, to talk about the brain imaging applications for understanding the effects of eye diseases on the brain. I mentioned initially that um, when we have a patient that comes to the clinic with an eye condition, we have an ophthalmologist that is only investigating or screening the eye. The ophthalmologist is not looking at the back of the eye, all right? A neuro-ophthalmologist may order an MRI or may, or may have a patient referred from a neurology department, so could you please assess the patient with Parkinson or Alzheimer's in case that there is something wrong or maybe the patient already complained because he has an issue with the vision. But if we want personalized medicine, I think every patient is different. So the idea is that we can use again the eye brain connectome approach, which if you come to my clinic and, and assess in your eyes, I would like to see also what happens in the brain. So this is pretty much what I want to show you uh, right now. So uh, we have advances in neuroimaging technology that have been instrumental in uncovering the uh, dynamic and neurological changes as I already showed you from all the previous 
uh, is nice. So the idea is that uh, we would like to understand how neuroplastic changes within the brain are linked to observed compensatory behaviors of the non-visual senses, for example, eating, touch, and smell, as well as cognitive skill, which is what I have been focusing um, uh, lately. Now, these are clinical cases and potential applications using the kernel flow device. You recall that I showed you that the knowledge of this is the functional near infrared spectroscopy tool that I use in our research specifically for um, investigating photosensitivity and ocular surface pain. What happened with these patients is that they come to the clinic and they have ocular pain. And when the doctor asks them what level of ocular pain do you have, they say three, level, three out of 10, five out of 10, 10 out of 10. But this is so subjective. <coughs> So the ophthalmologist or the eye doctor actually have not much information about how to address the level of pain based on what is the therapy or the management of, of the pain uh, over, the, over, over the time. So in this particular study that we ran with Dr. Galore, uh, we designed this, this actually a prospective study and the idea was, uh, was to capture the hemodynamic response that we can measure with this technology and we expose these patients with flicker light, right? the lights of six hertz uh, for a very short period of time because all of them had photosensitivity, so it was a test that was very painful for all of them. Um, the, the kernel protocol that we designed was simply a resting state first with the eyes closed so we can have the baseline uh, measurement and then we ask them to open their eyes and we expose them to the, expose them to the flicker uh, flashing light for uh, 90 seconds and then after that they close their eyes and relax just capture 30 seconds of that particular measure. I'm going to show you qualitatively what we observe in uh, patients with different level of pains reported subjectively by them. Right? So here we have individuals that with higher pain scores, here we have pain, the, the patient reported pain level 10 out of 10, and pain, pain level 3 out of 10. So the patient, the, the, these are individuals that with higher pain scores tend to exhibit more widespread and diffuse oxygenated hemoglobin activity than those with lower pain scores. And only showing the oxygenated component here, okay? On the blood flow. And then we also noticed that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was particularly active, especially in those with higher pain uh, scores, all right? Now, the activity can be observed in areas like the occipital, as you can see here. You can see the activities in the occipital area and the parietal lobes also. And these are actually areas that are all about processing visual information in space, so that's expected from the response. Now, this particular uh, approach um, can help the ophthalmologist to assess, for example, the ocular pain treatment that is expected. So the patient may come, we can screen their eyes. This doctor can have an idea of what's going on in the brain and try to see if this amount of big up areas can be probably less in the next visit or not, all right? Based on the exposition of the, uh, the flicker light, for example. And then finally, I would like to talk about the uh, biophotonics uh, market uh, overview. I think that many of you may be interested in this market when you graduate from here, so I hope that this information uh, can be attractive. Uh, first of all, um, let me show you the current, uh, the current global trends in the uh, biophotonics. And you see the numbers are very small there. Well, we have first of all that the increasing demand uh, right now in this market is for minimal invasive surgery. Driver in the market. You can see that the biophotonics market revenue uh, right now is in the order of um, around 50, 60 billion, and it's expected to be around 100 billion uh, in, in 2030. All right? um, there are things shifted, shifted in this area, for example, from microscopy of fixed uh, cells to video brain anoscopy of processing and between living cells in 3D. We are shifting from a structural imaging, which is a morphology, 
to molecular and functional imaging. We are shifting from two-dimensional to multi-dimensional imaging. Uh, we also have um, seen a seamless imaging from the level of the entire body down to the subcellular and the molecular level as the technologies are evolving. We also have developments from biopsy and ex vivo examination towards minimally invasive or non-invasive in vivo diagnostics. And also, uh, the one that I really like is that which is in pro-laboratory analysis to rapid sense testing, so we can do uh, more tests at point of care, or point of entry, or even at home, uh, where pretty much we want to care about the patient. And there is also a, close, a closer alliance of diagnosis and therapy. For example, we are seeing uh, more uh, technologies uh, for intraoperative diagnosis, uh, the feedback from your therapies, and also we are seeing combined diagnostic therapy laser systems. Uh, regarding the job market, this is what I found for uh, uh, photonics engineers in the USA, okay? So this is not this lab. Uh, most of them uh, have predominantly bachelor, uh, bachelor degree and uh, master degrees. Uh, and the growth uh, for, for this particular type of job is expected to increase uh, till 6% six, six by, uh, by 2026. I would like to mention also that if you, if you want to research a little more, that these are the two sites or organizations that can give you more information about the job market. One is Optics4, it's a very good searching uh, tool for uh, finding jobs in this particular market or, or area. And the SPIE has a career center that can also help you uh, with uh, your job search later. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledgement to all my uh, collaborators over the years. Um, we have plenty of collaboration nationally and internationally and also to all the uh, different type of funding that we have received to push forward our studies uh, over all these years. Thank you. And with all that said, I would like to uh, give you a space for, for questions. I think that there, there are there are 
various groups that are trying optogenetics right now, um, it appears to be that there's a technique that is going to really uh, improve uh, the, the, the therapy to develop it, you know? So this is something that this is very promising in the field lately, you know? Yeah. Everything is starting with animal models, you know? We have right now developments with the human uh, stories. The, you, you put a lot of emphasis on Parkinson's versus um, Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And also you mentioned cognitive and mild cognitive impaired. Do, can these modalities, you know, when it's, when it's the, the two diseases that are, uh, I guess, very well <coughs> um, degenerated by that point, it's easy to tell them because of those physical characteristics. But when you talk about cognitive impaired, can, can you back out the underlying cause of the cognitive impairment? Or is it is it just like, you know, like if it was like, I don't know, brain injury induced cognitive impairment, would you be able to distinguish that versus a yeah. related cognitive impairment? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a very good question. And that's one of the, the things uh, that are complicated in the differential diagnosis process, for example. Um, as I mentioned, I started the study trying to detect the biomarkers of Alzheimer's. I realized because there are so many comorbidities, right? Um, for example, um, we have ganglion cell layer thinning in Parkinson, in Alzheimer's, in multiple sclerosis. Even in patients with diabetes and retinopathy, even in patients with glaucoma. So there are many diseases affecting the eye and the brain that have the same characteristics. So how we are going to get differential diagnosis? And that's what we need to explore. That's what I moved multimodal approach because I just realized that structure can solve the problem with differential diagnosis. So we need to put more layers of information to just reduce this bandwidth and see if we can actually um, get there, right? Right now, for example, I have been for more than a year recruiting this population and I know it's like there is no, so there is no common sense going out there and trying to recruit patients with mild cognitive impairment, no matter the causation, with our comorbidities. Most of the studies, you check the literature, trying to use the eye as a biomarker for Alzheimer's, for example. When you see their population, their exclusion criteria is trying to get them out, because of course it's going to bias their studies. I just realized I need to get them. Who cares about the comorbidities? You need to get them to get the trains, so you can really be certain like when I send the patient may have an early risk or already have my cognitive impairment, that is because the my cognitive impairment, not because the inflammation that may be in place because diabetes, hypertension, you name it, see? So yeah, there are many groups, all of them are using unimodal approach, and that's what I just shifted like, when I try to do the eye function and structure right now, I just realized that I need to add the brain also, okay? So you need to add more layers, like the pupil information, like the eye motion, the more functional components to add into this picture, the better it will be to actually get a more objective biomarkers of early, of the early mild cognitive impairment. I don't really care about the causation, to be honest with you. What I want is to detect at the point of entry that that patient may have the risk of cognitive impairment, or may have already mild cognitive impairment. I will let the causation to the neurologist. So but what is important is that at the point of entry, you can detect the patient and allow them properly so you can stop the progression. Because right now we have some of the drugs that are out there being tested in clinical trials that may stop the progression. No cure yet, but it can stop the progression. So the bio, the biophysiological cues in the retina precede cognitive impairment? That that's, what been shown, that's what happens. Right. That's what has been actually reported in animal models. But remember, a mice and a human, right. it's a big, a big gap there, you know? But at least in animal models, it has been shown that amyloid beta could accumulate first in the retina than in the brain. Exploring the ocular pain in the eye, Eli just 
including my patients also with cognitive impairment. I see that the ivory connectome is fundamental for any type of neurodegenerative disease, no matter affecting the eye or the brain. And that's what I want to fuse, because I'm shifting now. I couldn't, it's too, too, too many things, but I'm shifting now also to, to do some um, uh, developments with visual reality. A visual reality gives us the capability to fuse the Kenna device, because it's a modular device, we got also the, uh, the headsets. Yeah. Do you have any information about what the spatial resolution is compared to like other modalities like the... Yeah, what happened is that the Kenner the, the flow, the F technology, has the spatial resolution is not compared to an MRI. So we have about 1.5 centimeters that we can go deep, uh, deep in the structure. So it's just at the cortical level, all right? So forget about going deeper to the hypothalamus, all right? You can, you're, you're not going to have that capability. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's really good. It's really good uh, regarding that. That's one of the advantages of using this device. Yeah, it's really good regarding noise and, uh, and what you're making.